Madonna. All right, I can't see any of you, which I'm sure you've heard today, so. Um, if you're here for a talk about how to better use React, you should probably go to the A-Track. So this talk is more about fun and just silliness. Uh, quickly, I'm Dylan. I've been working with JavaScript since 96. Uh, I was a bit of a masochist picking it up that early. You really couldn't do that much with it. In the time I was trying to put uh, results of my experiments in physical, ke physical chemistry online at the time, and about eight years later, I could do that with Dojo. So uh, things have changed a lot over that time. And I had my jokes stolen by Jen in her talk this morning, because my middle name is Carl, so I thought it'd be great to say that the reason it's called Carlsbad is because I'm bad. Um, but anyway, Carlsbad has an even more unusual history, kind of like how most things work in JavaScript or browsers. So the town was discovered in the late 1800s by someone, and they collected a water sample, and it happened to match the water quality and purity of a spa in the Czech Republic that had the name Carlsbad, but with a K, which stands for Charles's Bath, which because it was like a nice pure water city had a very nice spa. So of course it's named after something spelled wrong with after something that no longer has that name and no longer has any relationship to the original source, kind of like almost everything that happens today in browsers. So I thought that was pretty fitting. I also, in searching for the logo, found this lovely other logo called Carl's Bad Tech, and that reminded me of, for us, this talk about how to build the worst, world's worst website. So I thought that was pretty funny, because they probably did not intend for it to be Carl's Bad Tech instead of <laughs> Carl's Bad Tech. <laughs> also, I have never had so many mosquito bites in my life. I am always the person who manages to stand around everyone else who gets bit, and this time that's been me. I've had 50 bites or so. Um, so I'm going to remember MosquitoJSConf, WorkerDom, Jen's pixel art, for us is terrible website, and a few other things. And so, so far I'm having a great time. Now, how many are here for their first time at JSConf? Raise your hands. So if I'm not blind, it looks like roughly half of you. It's actually my first time as well, even though I've had a ticket four or five times before and always had to give it to someone else because the world had conspired against me to attend. But I'd like to flash back to JSConf 2013. Now, how many of you were here for that event? Okay, roughly 10 to 20%. So, the first JSConf a few years before that, Peter Higgins, one of our Dojo contributors early on, would pretty much troll everyone, as well as Chris Williams. He got into it quite well, the original creator of JSConf, and he would say, you know, someone would come up with this talk about some amazing new thing, and they'd be like, well, Dojo already did that. Come on, like, get with it, right? And the, the funny thing was jQuery was really popular, but Dojo had like promises, it had modules, and it had a build system, and it had the equivalent of web components, and it had some VDOM-ish stuff, and it had all these things like in 2007. And so this meme came to happen, but JSConf 2013 was also the year that React was first announced. So it was kind of a cool thing, and here's Pete Higgins giving the talk Dojo already did that, and they managed to capture an awesome screenshot of him making a ridiculous face, so that's why I had to show it. And the meme is Dojo already did that. Now, unfortunately, the DADD hashtag has been super, like, taken over by something really not worth checking out. I don't remember what it is, but just don't do it. Um, but the, the funny thing is, I was never involved with this, but I'd show up and I'd meet people like Adi Asmani, who's known as, like, the web performance, you know, god of all talks. And he, I show up in Google a couple years ago in London, and he's like, hey, Dylan, it's time for our selfie, man. And he's got the dojo already did that, you know, signs for us to take the photos. So this meme has followed me around forever, and I'm hoping that this is the year I can change it to be. React already did that. Also, Yanni of Formidable, he did this really fun tweet a few months ago, which was looking back at some of the quotes when React was first announced at JSConf, and it was pretty much universally panned. It was like, oh my god, JSX, why? Stop ruining JS people. I can see this getting out of hand quickly. This is terrible. So do we really not learn anything from the PHP days? Are you seriously going to mix markup and logic again? Like, people just love to react after that. But it's super, you know, it, it persevered and listened. So the question today is, has React already done that? And so you could answer that by, has React won? What will we say in five years at JSConf 2023, wherever that might be? 
Will we consider alternatives? How many of you use React as your primary framework of choice? So again, more than half, which is great. And so we started to work on Dojo back in 2004. And we built it over the years. We came out with 1.0 in 2007, and we came out with 2.0 a few months ago, and then 3.0 a couple months later, because we want to catch up to React 16 as quickly as possible. And <laughs> But when we did that, what we realized is it's time to, you know, pretty much our framework existed before ES5 was finalized, before ES6, before TypeScript, before web components, before HTML5, before mobile browsers came out. So it was a pretty heavily technical debted framework. And so we said, all right, if we're not just going to use React, if we want to create our own thing, and we've primarily been focused on the enterprise over the years, what are the things that matter to us? And for us, that was developer efficiency and ergonomics, longevity of things. Our customers have apps that they wrote. So funny story, Apple had the Apple Store running Dojo 0.4 for like eight years, which was just, we would cringe. We would beg them to update, and they're like, no, it works. All right, thanks, Apple. Um, unlike this laptop, which is on its fourth replacement in a year and a half, thing, but at least they keep replacing it, so that's good. Um, interoperability, I, I'm kind of tired of framework wars. I want things to just work together. And if any framework says it's perfect at everything, it's probably not perfect at anything. So, you know, when you build something, you need to be very focused on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, and what you're trying to build. And so, I would say that React has some challenges today as it grows, because we have been at the point where we were like a dominant framework, and now we're kind of like this unknown framework that no one's using. And the challenges you have is as you become big, you have to support legacy, you have to support all your users because you don't want to break them, which of course is a good thing, but that makes it very difficult to figure out what you want to do next and reinvent yourself to stay relevant instead of something else coming along to replace you. And I think that's the fundamental challenge that no one has solved in the 20 years of JavaScript in that we invent something and it's great and then we get fatigued from supporting it, the early contributors get burnt out, they back off. And then someone else comes along with the next big thing. Maybe it's Vue, maybe it's Svelte, maybe it's New Dojo, whatever. There's, I find the biggest challenge React has today is cohesion across projects. So I imagine if all of you raised hands and shared your React applications, yeah, your render functions would look similar, but I bet you might be using different routers, different components, different approaches to your build process. Some of you might be using TypeScript, some of you might be using Flow, some of you might be using vanilla JavaScript and so on, and there's not a lot of direction around what's the right way to build the perfect React application. And that's both its strength and its weakness. And like I said, too many choices. So developer ergonomics means many things to many people, but to me what I'm trying to get at is I want to do things that are the right way out of the box without having to be an expert at every esoteric feature of the language. So, by default, in a, you know, something that's nice and ergonomically friendly has a consistent architecture. It doesn't feel like each package or each piece of my framework is different or feels different or feels inco inconclusive. Give me some good, good defaults out of the box, so don't make me think if I don't have to. Like, if I know better than you, framework author, great, let me do my thing. But by default, don't make me answer 5,000 questions before I get started. And of course, help me facilitate the authoring of better code. So if a framework is getting in my way or it's I'm having to go through great workarounds to get it to behave consistently, I've kind of lost the benefit of having a framework to begin with. So I'm a big fan of TypeScript. I'm sure that's not surprising to anyone who's met me. I know TypeScript gets mixed ratings in the React community, and I think that's okay. So, and there's Flow, of course. So TypeScript, I like it better because it supports interfaces. And that goes back to that interoperability goal of, hey, I've got this dependency and I want to replace it with something else. In almost every other programming language, we have an interface definition that we know if this object has this method and this property and this whatever and whatever, that I can safely swap that out with something else. In JavaScript, we've never really had that. And so TypeScript facilitates that, but you need to define some types to then be able to define interfaces to then be able to say, okay, I can swap this thing out with this other thing. The other nice benefit of defining types and the ergonomic benefit there is that I can't remember why I wrote something the way I did two months later, much less a year or two later. And so TypeScript and Flow sort of force you to define what you were thinking and so that you can remember your own code later, much less your, your teammates and your colleagues. 
Also, I used to joke that there was no need for, you know, people would come to Dojo and JavaScript training workshops we would lead, and they'd be like, okay, Dylan, this is cool, but I'm a Java developer, where's my autocomplete? And I'd be like, you're an idiot. You just remember everything in your head. Like, why, why would you ever want autocomplete? It makes you a lazy engineer, right? And that's kind of funny until you make typos and can't find them and, and so on. So actually having first class ID support with autocompletion is really nice, especially when you get into more involved APIs that are difficult to remember. So last year, we wrote a framework series and we did a music theme and the idea behind it, it was a 200 and some page blog series. So it was really concise and terse. Um, but basically we looked at frameworks and asked about a thousand questions to help you try to evaluate a framework for you. And it wasn't about telling you which framework to use, it was to try to help you think deeper than music selection. So I used to joke that if we picked our music like we picked our framework, we would all be using justinbieber.js, right? Because, and that obviously was not cool in 2013 and it's definitely not cool today. So when you're choosing a framework, you need to sort of get beyond the surface and dig deeper. And so, you know, when you look at ergonomics, I'm just gonna look at three things today that are different than React. And that's Views, Svelte, and Dojo. And it's not because I'm saying use those instead of React, but just a sort of a comparison. So I'm trying to figure out why Vue is popular. So I look at it and I think, well, this is kind of like React. It's not necessarily faster. But I think the reason people like it is, I think there's two reasons it's gained popularity. One, you can kind of use something that's closer to HTML. So people who historically hate JavaScript frameworks, but maybe they loved jQuery, find it more approachable and easier to get started with, and yet they can still build real applications out of it. The other reason I think is that Evan Yu is just very good at communicating with everyone about how great the framework is and how to use it, and he's very passionate. And it really shows how much a strong leader of a project can really drive adoption and encourage growth. Svelte, I don't know, how many of you have heard of Svelte? I can barely see, I only see like a couple of hands going up. It's intended to be the magical disappearing UI framework. And the idea behind it is you write some code following some conventions that are mostly aligned with modern standards, and you end up with something that doesn't feel like you used a framework at all because the build process kind of removes the pieces you don't need. And that's really nice because by default you're writing code that's aligned with modern standards and doing that. There are a lot of ways to measure performance. And to me, an ergonomic approach to building applications is one that's performant out of the box. So there was an article a few months ago, there's this reference application called the real world application. And the real world application is intended to give a more substantial than like to do MVC look at how you build applications and to tell you how does a framework actually look and how does it actually compare in the real world. And so this person took a bunch of the examples, basically took all the client side frameworks that were, had reference examples. Ember's not on there, not because he didn't like Ember, but because Ember did not provide an example. So, and what they found was that Svelte and Dojo painted much faster than any of the other options on there. And App Run, I think, which I hadn't heard of before, but that's kind of cool, right? And then a big reason for that is the initial bundle size for Svelte, Dojo, and App Run were really small. And that's because Svelte is doing this thing where it's basically taking all the stuff and removing it at build time that you don't need. And Dojo is basically saying, I'm only going to include for your initial render the stuff you need to render up front. So it's doing all the different optimizations that you might want. We also did a Hacker News PWA Dojo example application and I didn't know Lighthouse could get all 100s, which is pretty cool, uh, it was pretty amazing. Now, the reason is we've basically cheated by only including what you need to actually render your app. Now, it sounds simple, but a lot of times we're like, oh, just use code splitting, just use Webpack, and then you go down seven levels of hell and you never actually get there. And the idea behind a good ergonomic solution is to say, all right, if we're gonna have to use Webpack, you don't have to be a Webpack expert to get the fastest application. Instead, we'll just look at what you're doing and we'll optimize it for you by default. So, Dojo's pros, you know, they're one way to look at it. Obviously, when you decide what framework to use, you need to make your own pros and cons lists based on your own analysis. But the idea is, it's got components, they import and export to web components, it's using TypeScript for ergonomics, it leverages and aligns with a bunch of modern standards rather than trying to deviate from them or come up with its own thing. 
but it's also something that's really, really straightforward and easy to make fast, and that's kind of nice. So, optimization of ergonomics to me um, means, all right, if you're gonna have build system, how do you make an application fast? Well, you, you follow all of Alex Russell's guidelines for PWAs. Alex Russell is the Google standards evangelist who was originally a Dojo co-founder with me, and he's pretty much the get off my long grandfather of JavaScript, who talks about 3G networks and really slow Android phones, and we like to troll him, asking him why Google won't buy him a good device. Um, but anyway, so starting out with all the recommendations for PWAs, having a good CLI tooling that will do what we call build time rendering, which is look at what you need to render first and build that into the initial bundle. Build that HTML and CSS and JavaScript into that page up front to render it. Follow the purple guidelines, do code splitting. But the killer for us is, okay, yeah, we still need to support IE11 because enterprises, um, but if you don't need it, let's not include it. So the idea with Dojo is it's evergreen by default, and then you add in the polyfills and ponyfills and backport support you need. So you start out with something really small and lean, whereas Dojo 1 started out with everything to support back to IE6 and no way to remove it. So obviously by flipping that around, you start out by supporting the users that, can, that only need your fastest applications first, and then you add in legacy support as an opt-in rather than an opt-out. So, like I said, we've really aimed to be lean, and I think any ergonomic framework should be focused on that. So one, you need to make it easy and consistent to write code. You can use things like TypeScript, you can use other tools like Prettier and so on, and Webpack and whatever, but the idea is ergonomics are something where you write code and you're not having to make a lot of changes and things are just natural and work the way they should. So, we align with pretty much every modern pattern and standard that should be followed. Um, and the reason for that is Dojo 1 was started in 2004. There were no mobile devices. There was no GitHub. There was no promises. There was no module system. There was no build approach. There were no web components. There were no array iteration methods. There was no for each. There was no prototype.bind. We had to invent all of these things. And of course, we didn't invent them the right way. We just came up with a way. And the problem with that is it's really cool to innovate and, and draw things forward, but then you become incompatible with the rest of the web, and that's not good. So what we've done is we've said, let's find all the modern standards that are out there that make sense, that help you make a fast application, but let's not impose the weight of those standards on you. So use them the way the language intends them, and, and I'll give a couple examples right here. So for example, in Dojo, and we've been doing this for a couple of years now, all widgets or components by default are importable or exportable as web components. The idea being, I create this nice widget with Dojo, I wanna use it in an Angular application or a React application or a Vue application. As long as I can get a web component working there, I can import it or export it. Now web components and custom elements are not a perfect standard, but that's sort of the first path to interoperability between component libraries and systems. And because Dojo's bundle size is so small, it's not inconceivable to think that it's a bad idea to include Dojo to be able to do that. How many of you have used intersection observers or resize observers? I'm not seeing any hands go up, but I might just be blind by the light at this point. Okay, so an intersection observer and a resize observer are new observable style APIs that are in browsers that help you know if something has moved into view of a particular box or if the browser has resized itself. So we used to have to do a lot of hacks to do like infinite scrolling lists and resize detection. And we align with those, as well as web animations and focus events. Now the reason these are particularly interesting is in the React world, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, um, yeah. In the React world, typically when you need to do something on a DOM node, you have to sort of go through a bunch of hoops to get a reference to a node to then do something. What we've done with Dojo is we've said instead of breaking the reactive architecture with a VDOM system, we instead say, you know what? Those are cool things to expose. Let's make them as avail available as properties that you can react to. So basically, anytime we find something where it's like, man, I wish I just had a reference to a DOM node, instead of saying, here's a DOM node and breaking the architecture, we say, well, why? And then we provide those properties as something you can react to. I don't know if you can see that, because I can't see it. Let me come out of the light. Yeah, so the idea here is, basically, you import this meta property, and this one's for an intersection observer, and then you can just react to its properties and changes later. 
So rather than having to get the node and figure out if something's inside of something else, you can just use this API and quickly work with it inside of a render function to determine if something is inside of something else and then react to that. So the idea is, if you've got a long page with a lot of images or you've got a news feed or some other UI like that, you don't want to load all the, the content and images down below. So as the user scrolls, then you start to prefetch the images or prefetch the content that you want to render. So it's a really nice, fast way to do that. We've tried to align with standards. So instead of saying, oh, let's use SAS or let's use less or let's use Stylus, we've aligned with something called Post CSS. And what that is is it's kind of like Babel but for styling. So it takes all the CSS next properties, like the variables, they call them something else, but the variables and the nesting of things and whatnot, lets you write CSS syntax as the spec proposes it, and then transpiles it back to CSS that works in today's browsers. And then we also do something that's kind of fun in Dojo, which is you write CSS modules for your components, you write a set of classes for that component, and then we scope them unique to that component, so we kind of break the C part of CSS, so it just be called style sheets, right? And then what we do is we use TypeScript to compile that CSS into a TypeScript module that then we can import in your widget. You're like, why would you do that? Well, it's just a list of string names, but then for that IDE experience, when you go to theme or style your component, you can only include the class names that have been scoped to that widget. So you don't have to go back and look at that file, you don't have to accidentally typo the class name and wonder why things aren't rendering the way they should. That sound, it's like a little tiny thing. Maybe that saves you five or 10 seconds a day. But that's what ergonomics is all about. It's looking for those silly little pain points and trying to refine them and make them a bit better. We also uh, support internationalization and accessibility out of the box with all of our components. Internationalization as a spec is almost as large as all of ECMAScript um, 2000, whatever year we're in, 2018 plus all the years before. It's just a very convoluted and involved spec and it's still evolving. And doing that out of the box is really important to be able to support that efficiently. Um, how many of you are British or non-American? A few? Okay, so you may have heard of this called routing. And you're probably wondering why everyone here calls it routing. I don't know the answer, but I'm bilingual here. Both forms of English, so there we go. Um, what, we, what we've done is we've said, you know, one of the benefits of having a set of things that actually work together. So previously, for years, we've said micro frameworks, vanilla JS for the win. And then you realize when you build up a bunch of things, you've got 500 megs of NPM dependencies, and, and you've just got a lot of technical debt, but you've also got a lot of repetition. So knowing that, hey, I've got a component system that works this way, we have a routing system that can be added after the fact. So the idea behind an ergonomic routing system is one that's declarative, where you've written an application, you've written some co components, you've managed your state in some sort of store, and then you can add routing on top of that without having to rewrite any of your components or any of your logic or any of your interactions. We have an application state store. It started out very similar to Redux, not surprising, but we've diverged quite significantly. Probably the biggest thing we don't like about Redux is it's not always clear where in Redux you're supposed to do things. Where do you put your business logic? Where do you do your reducers? And on and on. And you ask the Redux team and they give you different answers. And sometimes their answers change over time. So the idea behind our store is we've got three separate sort of places in a store. And it's very clear, like, this is where you do your reduction style code. This is where you do your business logic. And this is where you do your transformations and so forth. And the benefit of that is certainty and consistency, so that if you've worked with a Dojo store in one application and you come to another application from a different company, it won't feel completely different, hopefully. Again, this is talk is not like I'm telling you what we did in Dojo, mostly to sort of contrast it with some of the things that we observe in React, because we do quite a bit of work with React as well, so it's not like I'm trying to say all your React users are wrong and you should come use Dojo. That's not the intent here. Just to sort of tell you, the things we do, because maybe they'll help make your React applications better as well. Um, Dojo 1 was particular. how many of you actually use Dojo 1, by the way? Okay, so 10, 20%, more than I expected. So that's cool. So Dojo 1 started out with not the best test suite. I mean, it was really difficult to do the things we do today. Dojo 2 has near 100% code coverage analysis on everything, every kind of test you can imagine, and also, a set of utilities, I would say it's somewhat similar to Enzyme, 
but for the idea is you want to be able to test components as easily as you can test raw DOM nodes. Otherwise, it can become really difficult and tedious to write tests for your widgets. So a Dojo application might just use these APIs. It might use the core framework and a build system. And then you might use some widgets and themes, maybe the test tooling, and maybe some interoperability. The interoperability package includes things like support for Redux. So if you have a Redux store and you want to experiment with a Dojo application, you can do that. So Dojo and pretty much most modern frameworks claim to be reactive. And that's not something React invented. Like the previous talk said, almost nothing is new in JavaScript. Almost everything is pulled from somewhere else. So the idea of reactive architectures is not new to JavaScript. But these are the things that Dojo does and that pretty much most modern frameworks do. So if you want to learn about Dojo, we're in a lot of places, but the key is if you're looking at something that looks like ES3 or ES5 code, you're in the wrong place. That's the old Dojo. So just forget about that unless you still need to support that. If you're looking for a modern TypeScript framework, that's where Dojo.io comes into place. How many of you have used Code Sandbox? Not a lot. Okay. It is the coolest online editor ever um, because it is, it's written by a couple of people from the Netherlands that are in their late teens or early 20s, and it is phenomenal. So it takes Monaco, which is the um, editor, like the actual IDE portion of um, VS Code, but it works in a browser. But then they've taken that and they've added like all sorts of support for features. So we can do like TypeScript um, TypeScript basically error detection and validation in the browser. We can do webpack builds on the fly. We can do CSS compilation on the fly. It's just phenomenal. And they have templates for React and Angular and Dojo and Vue and Svelte and a handful of other frameworks. So it's really quick as like you just want to try something out or see an example. It's a great environment to try that out. So um, getting involved with Dojo, we're part of the JS Foundation, which is one of the other sponsors here. Uh, the JS Foundation was actually started as a merger between the jQuery Foundation and Dojo Foundation, and it's an open source foundation that the idea is to protect a project from turning evil. So the, probably the biggest uproar until about a year and a half ago with React was that React had this weird clause about patents that no one understood in their licensing. And until enough people complained, I think it was WordPress that finally complained and they changed the license. But the idea behind a foundation is to prevent those types of issues from ever coming up. We have a lot of help online, as any good ergonomic framework should have. Um, and then we also offer commercial support for people. So I'll talk about SitePen in a moment, but it's not really a big deal. But so the idea behind ergonomics is not one little thing. It's about looking at all these little pieces and finding a way to make things better. So it's about creating applications that are fast. It's about looking for pain points, things that break the architecture, variable names, package resources, bundle sizes, technical debt, and just not accepting things that don't feel right. So I've seen a few talks here where I, I admit I kind of got bored with the talk, and it wasn't that I'm an asshole. Well, okay, maybe I am, but um, I looked at it and I'm like, I don't like that variable name, right? And it's such a stupid reason to say I don't want to listen to this talk. But to me, it's like if you pick a variable name that feels like it's giving me cognitive dissonance while I'm reading it, I'm just disagreeing with you as a framework author that this is wrong, right? And so when you're caring about your users enough to say, I want to make it so, you know what? I should look at every object or class name or whatever, or property name, and it should be obvious what it does. I shouldn't have to wonder, hmm, I wonder what that is about, right? So React already did that. I would love that to be the new meme from this conference. I think it would be funny. I think it'd be great to troll the React team, but you don't have to. Um, so the question is, okay, in five years, will React still be here? Absolutely. Is React going away? Of course not. Has React heavily inspired others? So you know, the question was, like, all these things from Dojo made their way into standards, made their way into React and other frameworks. Is React doing the same thing to other frameworks today? Absolutely, like, without a doubt. Does everything you do have to be React? No. I mean, why not, right? So can we safely say React already did that? I would say yes. Now that's my own hypothesis. You can come to your own conclusions, of course. And could we say Dojo already did that again? We'll ask that question now and we'll answer it in five years, hopefully. So uh, to conclude, work with SitePen, we've been around since 2000, which is like, you know, 100 million years in JavaScript time. 
And we are also a remote consulting company. We've been around for a long time, and we help lots of great companies try to do better with JavaScript. The fun thing is we actually trained Facebook back in like 2008 on how to write JavaScript code, which is cool. So back when they were just PHP people who did not know how to write good JavaScript, we went in and taught them that, and we helped make Facebook fast. So we've helped lots of companies throughout the years make the web better. We also do some really fun things. So if you haven't gotten your swag bag yet, get it. If you haven't looked inside of it, you'll find one of these. Who's opened this yet? A few people. This is a card game we created called Milestone Mayhem. It's not just a deck of cards. It's a de deck of cards about everything that goes wrong in projects. So the Mayhem cards are the fun cards. There's like the Grim Repo, who's the guy who pushes to production without testing. There's the Scope Creep, who everyone hates. And the idea is the game is kind of played like Blackjack meets Russian Roulette, which is kind of like how software development works. Basically, you're a project manager. Yes. You're a project manager trying to get to 20 story points before your opponent. So if you come to the fireside chat tonight, bring your game, and I'll show you how to play. We also run a podcast called TalkScript, which is kind of fun. And on the table out there, there should still be some M&Ms that are TalkScript branded. Um, they taste as good as our content is. So. And we've also been interviewing a lot of the speakers here, so that content will be online in the next couple weeks. So um, I don't know how much time that is, but I hope it's about the right time. So thank you for coming.